Tonight on The Buzz, we look at the latest in audio technology and gear, from networking to live production to on-set mixers. We start with Paul Isaacs, the Director of Product Management and Design for Sound Devices. Tonight, Paul shares new audio technology for mixing and recording audio on set, including new devices specifically aimed at musicians. Next, RME began more than 20 years ago. Today, it is known as one of the leaders in live audio production. Tonight, Derek Badala, the Director of Sales for the Americas for RME, tells us about the company, their latest products, and new audio technology we need to watch. Next, Spoken Layer is creating a new form of radio supported by media giants like Gannett, Hearst, and others. Tonight, Jeremy Mims, the head of strategy for Spoken Layer, describes what they are doing, why it's drawing such interest, and why media creators need to pay attention. Next, Roland makes a wide range of musical, audio, and video products. Tonight, Rob Reed, business development manager for Roland, talks about their latest audio products along with the latest new audio technology. All this, plus James Deruvo with our weekly Dottle News update. The buzz starts now. Since the dawn of digital filmmaking, authoritative. One show serves a worldwide network of media professionals. Current. Uniting industry experts. Production. Filmmakers. Post-production. And content creators around the planet. Distribution. From the media capital of the world in Los Angeles, California, the digital production buzz goes live now. Welcome to the Digital Production Buzz, the world's longest-running podcast for the creative content industry covering media production, post-production, and marketing around the world. Hi, my name is Larry Jordan. Tonight, we're looking at audio from a variety of different perspectives, recording audio on set, audio for live productions, mixing consoles, and a new way of distributing content from a company that thinks of itself as the new radio. As we all know, the best way to improve the quality of our picture is to improve the quality of our sound. And tonight, we look at a number of ways to make that happen. Before we start, though, I want to invite you to subscribe to our free weekly show newsletter at digitalproductionbuzz.com. Every issue every week provides quick links to the different segments on the show, plus articles of interest to filmmakers. Best of all, it's free and comes out every Saturday morning. And now it's time for our Doddle News Update with James DeRuvo. Hello, James. Happy Thursday, Larry. A wonderful Thursday to you. What have we got that's tops on your list? Well, it's been a big week for Red. You remember last week we talked about how AT&T and Verizon uh, have come on board to carry the Hydrogen One smartphone. This week, we've also learned that RED is teaming up with VR camera company Lucid to create a standalone four-view 3D camera. It will shoot with dual 4K cameras that are then beam split to create a holographic 8K image, which is one of the big problems I've had with virtual reality is, is the resolution is just terrible. So RED is looking to push that all the way up to 8K for the holographic Hydrogen One smartphone. And then on top of that, they've also decided to simplify their product line. They're going to discontinue the Epic W and the Weapon platform in favor of a single DSMC2 brain that will house either the Monstro 8K Vista Vision, the Helium 8K Super 35 sensor, or the Gemini 5K Super 35 sensor, which is that super low light sensor. And all the other brains are going to be put on sale and will be discontinued. So Red is like really fine tuning where they're going in the future. Well, with this product line simplification, do you think that's good news or bad news? Well, I think it's definitely good news. Red has always looked over the over the horizon. They have, they've always wanted to push the push the state of the art where it needs to go. And I think part of doing that is Red has to let go of its past to stretch towards the future. And they're doing that by concentrating all of its effort on the DSMC2 platform and the hydrogen smartphone. And by simplifying their product lines, they can push that state of the art beyond AK without being weighed down by what they're doing today. Okay, that's red. What's next? Canon is selling 
a 120 megapixel APS-H image sensor. They've been developing this sensor for quite a while, and it's not the only one. They also have a 250 megapixel image sensor that they've been developing. But they're offering this sensor for sale to anyone who wants to buy it. It can uh, image at 13K resolution, but the only downside is it can only re image at about 10 frames per second. It was designed for the security camera industry, but it's incredibly sharp. It gets about somewhere between five and six times better resolution than 1080p. They showed this picture of a, at a football game where they were the camera was across the field and they were able to really get a tight shot of somebody's face and get in a lot of super detail. So it's an incredible sensor resolution-wise. They've just got to work on the frame rate. Uh, and they're also offering a 5-megapixel global shutter-supported image sensor so there's no... Uh, rolling shutter and a full HD ultra sensitive model that can image in near darkness at a hundred frames per second and all three of them will be for sale through their phase one corporation. Well it seems like all three of these are sensors in search of a market. What do you think? Well I'm not really sure what to make of Canon's move here but it could be that they're trying to test the waters to compete with Sony which has been providing image sensors to other camera competitors for years. The fact that these are highly specialized seems to indicate that ever-conservative Canon is dipping their toes into the water to see what ripples they can generate. But who knows? <laughs> okay, we've got Red and Canon. What's our third story? Well, Magic Lantern has returned, and they're bringing 2.5K to the EOS M mirrorless camera. It creates 2520 by 1080 images with 12-bit raw DNG to the standard Canon M mirrorless, which was generally considered a disappointment when it was first released. But you got to be careful with it because it's highly experimental and it could literally fracture your SD card and maybe even brick your camera. So for now, it remains in the high in the nightly bid. In the, so now it remains in the nightly build and you should just be cautious and let them work out all the bugs before you install it. Well, Magic Lantern is making Canon look really good. Well, they always have. They're also working on cracking open the latest Digix 7 processor, which is used on the 6D Mark II. The Canon 80D is getting 14-bit DNG raw. Honestly, Larry, I don't know why Canon just doesn't hire every single one of these guys and call it a day. They're able to make the Digix platform and take it and make it into what every Canon camera simply wants it to be. So what stories are we working on besides these three? Other stories we're following this week include Sony is investing $9 billion in next generation image sensors over the next three years. And Apple will stream the Worldwide Developers Conference on June 4th. And I'm expecting updates on all the software as well as refreshes, hopefully, on the iMac, the iPad Pro, and the MacBook Pro, to name a few. <laughs> Well, we'll just have to see. And for people who want to keep track of these and all the other stories you're covering, where can they go on the web? All these stories and more can be found at DottleNews.com. And James DeRuvo is the editor-in-chief of DottleNews.com and joins us every week. James, take care. We'll talk to you next week. Have a good weekend. Here's another website I want to introduce you to, DottleNews.com. DottleNews gives you a portal into the broadcast, video, and film industries. It's a leading online resource presenting news, reviews, and products for the film and video industry. DottleNews also offers a resource guide and crew management platform specifically designed for production. These digital call sheets, along with their app, directory, and premium listings, provide in-depth organizational tools for busy production professionals. Dottle News is a part of the Thalo Arts community, a worldwide community of artists, filmmakers, and storytellers. From photography to filmmaking, performing arts to fine arts, and everything in between, Thalo is filled with resources you need to succeed. Whether you want the latest industry news, need to network with other creative professionals, or require state-of-the-art online tools to manage your next project, there's only one place to go, doddlednews.com.
Paul Isaacs is the Director of Product Management and Design for Sound Devices. He is responsible for the development and evolution of products for both sound devices and video devices. He has a background as an engineer, a product developer, and a musician. Hello, Paul. Welcome back. Hi there, Larry. Thanks for having me. On tonight's show, we're talking about audio in a variety of different applications. But to get us started, how would you describe sound devices? Sound devices is a manufacturer of mixers, multi-track recorders, and wireless products for the uh, production industry. The, primarily, uh, sound for picture is uh, our forte, although we are branching out into other markets now. Well, I understand there's an interesting story behind how the company got its name. Oh, the sound device's name. Yes, in the very early days, the uh, the CEO, the CEO uh, Matt and John Anders, uh, and John to Tools, they were trying to come up with a name for the company. They were really struggling to find uh, a non-cheesy name for an audio company. And they were just struggling for many, many days. And then one day they were sitting in the, in the office and there's some shelves in the corner of the office. And they looked up at the top shelf and there's a box sitting in the corner with the label sound devices written on it. And it was just a box of miscellaneous bits and pieces. And they thought, well, hold on a sec, sound devices. That's perfect. And that's where the company name was born. <laughs> Simple as that. <laughs> I know that sound devices has branched out to both sound devices and video devices. But for today, I just want to focus on the audio. Okay. And within the audio products that you create, what's your target in terms of developing product? Number one is audio quality, the quality of the mic preamps. I mean, that's how our clients are judged by the quality of the audio that they deliver to the, their clients, you know, the production companies. So that's first and foremost. Secondly, the build quality. Our customers who are primarily production sound mixers uh, working on film and TV and documentaries and reality shows can be shooting anywhere in the world in any environment. So it's important that the equipment can stand up to the rigors of any situation. They're the two foremost things, but also our products, they're very feature rich. And that's to satisfy a multitude of different workflows that our clients need to work in. And that requires that our software feature set is diverse and very flexible. We're always trying to lead the industry and we've led the industry in multiple ways. I can give you a few examples if you like. Go ahead. We're the first manufacturer for portable mixer recorders that include auto mixing. Auto mixing has been around for many, many years, of course, uh, but it, especially in today's productions where there are so many mic sources, the potential for increased background noise is much higher. So to have an auto mix feature in a recorder and a mixer to reduce that background noise, which it does, by the way, by effectively attenuating mics that are not being spoken into, that helps to reduce the background noise and make it for a much cleaner mix. When you talk about auto mixing, it just sounds like you're taking the fader on the mic and pulling it all the way down, although doing it in software rather than by twisting the fader. You're recording multiple channels which means each mic is on its own channel. Why do we care? For live situations, it's not always about recording. If an auto mix can allow you to increase gain um, in a live situation before feedback occurs because it's closing or attenuating some of the mics. So that's one application. But many of our customers need to be delivering a mix rather than the ISOs because they are fast turnaround productions like news productions or something like this. So... To be able to provide a mix, a clean mix, is essential. I'm used to sound devices being used for production sound, where we're recording the sound, we take it back and we mix it down for the program or the, the movie. But I hadn't realized you guys were also used in live sound. Normally, wouldn't that be a, a sound truck and, and a full mixing console? Uh, yes, I mean, that's true. Obviously, for smaller um setups with maybe smaller musical outfits like a jazz quartet or a small ensemble our products are used by some of our our clients to record you know that type of live event we do have a product called the 970 which is a 64 track audio recorder which is perfect for large-scale 
live event recording, multi-mic multi events like classical concert or live sporting events or something like that because it can handle so many sources. That is not a mixer, but it's using conjunction with one of the many mixers out there, whether from Yamaha or Alan Heath or Midas or whomever. And the way we typically connect from our 64-track audio recorder to these consoles is via audio over IP. We use something called the Dante protocol. Dante is, and any audio over IP protocol, although Dante is the most common in the industry right now, it really does simplify routing of audio in a complex network of devices. Whereas previously, to route something from one place to another, you would need multiple cables. Now you can connect all devices simply by an RJ45 CAT5 cable. And you can, for each device can select any channel from any one of those other devices on the same network. And there's something known as Dante controller, which is like a big input output matrixing um, utility, which allows you to pull up any device on that network and select any channel and route it to any other destination channel. It's so easy. And this is all achieved with a minimum of uh, Cat5 cable. To do the same thing with standard XLR and analog or even ASEBU, or even MADI for that matter, would be much, much more complex and expensive. So that's one of the key advantages of Dante. The other cool thing about it is it's really low latency. It's all uncompressed audio. And it can use standard off-the-shelf routers. No expensive hardware is used. One of the key reasons why it's taken off is because you don't necessarily need to be an IT expert to get a, a, a Dante network set up. Does an audio recorder need to worry about what he's going to be recording when he decides what sound device is geared to buy? I guess the key here is how many channels do you need? And there, there are multiple ways for recording music. Some engineers prefer to record with a very natural stereo pair um, rather than discreetly miking up instruments. And some engineers would combine the two um, processes. I mean, you want to be able to, for, for that natural feeling, you want to be able to capture some of the natural ambience, often you do anyway, um, of the venue that you're performing in, especially if it's something like a, a choir concert or a classical concert that sort of adds to the realism of the recording. Um, so depending on the engineer, they would choose to have a pair of ambient mics set up and perhaps even the main pair for recording, uh, they'd use a main pair for recording the, the actual live ensemble as well. Other engineers would prefer to uh, have a microphone on each individual instrument so that they can then tweak and adjust the mix at, at a later stage. So a number of channels is important. You really want high quality mic preamps for music because of the wide dynamic range. So you want preamps that can handle, especially in sort of music such as classical, where you're going from the extreme quiets to the extreme louds. You want something that can capture those extreme quiets without sort of um, adding any or without the noise of the preamps becoming perceivable. All preamps on sound devices gear are exceptional and would suffice. We're particularly proud of the preamps on our latest range of recorders, the Mix Pre series, um, which come in a, a several different models. And they have extremely low noise preamps, such that even if you record the level really quite low with too much headroom, say you're peaking to even minus 30 dBFS, so 30 dBs of headroom, if you were to boost that signal in a computer at a later stage, you, the signal would come up, but the noise would too. But because the noise was so low initially, you still wouldn't hear it. And that's the advantage of our preamps. Well, that gets me to ask what your latest products are. So what have you got that's new? A couple of things. We uh, introduced the Mix Pre series of recorders last year. Um, the Mix Pre 3 and the Mix Pre 6 came out May last year. And since then, we've added two further models, a Mix Pre 10T, which is a, a 10 input, 12 track recorder with built in mixer. And it's a USB audio interface as well, a 12 in four out USB audio interface. And it also has a built in time code generator and reader. 
And this is um, an ideal um, entry level product for those who are wanting to get into production sound. It has a touch screen interface. It's obviously all powered by batteries, uh, records to SD card, and it's even got um, um, a USB port for uh, auto copying to a USB thumb drive. About a month ago, we released another model, the MixPre 10M, as opposed to the T. And the M stands for musician. And this product, although it looks very similar to the MixPre 10T, and it, it is in terms of its I.O. and its interface, we totally rewrote the record and playback engine to be uh, suited to overdubbing in the way you would with a typical door. 12 tracks is quite a lot. If you think about it, that would allow you to lay two tracks for drums, a track for a bass guitar, uh, maybe two tracks for electric guitar, so that's a total of five, maybe another two tracks for vocals, that's seven, maybe two tracks for keyboards, that's nine, and you're pretty much there at the essence of a, of a band recording. If you did use up all the 12 tracks, we've prov provided the ability to bounce down as well. So this MixPre 10M is really like a portable music production studio. It's a bit like the old Porter Studios that the, that that came out, and the, you know there's the Tascam four track in the early days of this. Um, this this takes it to the next level because a lot of these older Porter Studios didn't have very good quality mic preamps, so really they were only good for demos. The Mix Pre 10M, but by virtue of the high quality mic preamps. And also, by the way, it has built-in reverb effects, really high-quality reverb effects. You can pretty much come out with a final produced song on the Mixpre 10M without ever having to sit in front of a computer. Many musicians, and I'm one of them, by the way, that's uh, what I do, like to do in my spare time. Many musicians will tell you that when they're sitting in front of a computer making music, they feel more like an IT engineer rather than an artist. And this was the basic philosophy behind this MixPre 10M. It allows the user to get away from a computer, simply plug in their instrument into the MixPre 10M and record an overdub, multiple tracks of super high quality audio, then finally mix their song and also then upload it and share it with band members and other people online. And it's refreshing. It allows you to focus back on your art and... I have to say I made this product for me. Well, actually, Sound Devices is a company who is full that, that's full of musicians. And I think we built this product for ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> and for people that want more information about this and all the other products Sound Devices have, where can they go on the web? Sounddevices.com. That's all one word, sounddevices.com. And Paul Isaacs is the Director of Product Management and Design for Sound Devices and Video Devices. Paul, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Larry. Derek Badala is the Director of Sales for the Americas for RME. RME makes a comprehensive range of audio interfaces, converters, and mic preamps for both Windows and Macintosh systems. Hello, Derek. Welcome. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing great because I haven't learned a whole lot about RME over the years, and I'm looking forward to talking to you about what RME is. So let's start with the most obvious question. How would you describe RME? Simply put, RME is a audio equipment manufacturer for studio, live, and broadcast. For the last, oh, I'd say 18, 20 years, we're probably most known for audio interfaces for recording, but we also uh, have put a lot of product out there for MADI solutions that has typically wound up in live sound. Well, why is live sound different from studio? Typically in live sound, especially for large shows like Broadway or Cirque du Soleil or Super Bowl halftime show, you've got a high density of audio channels in a playback rig where the live performers are playing along with that. And so they need a protocol that can handle those high number of channels. And Maddie fits that quite well. It's very reliable. It has redundancy built in. And it's a point-to-point -point format, very similar to Toslink 8 app. Light pipe is probably a format that your listeners maybe have heard of. 
Uh, it's sort of like that, but 64 channels of 48 kilohertz, 24 bit audio instead of just eight. So, and it's transmitted through either BNC or fiber. And um, so you'll see stage boxes with, you know, 64 mic inputs to Maddie going to a console, et cetera. So um, very, very common in live sound. And when you parlay that to our audio interfaces where you're playing back something from say, uh, Ableton Live or Pro Tools, and you're doing 64 discrete tracks that you're syncing to with a live band, uh, you need the ability to get that audio reliably through an audio interface that's not going to die in the middle of a show. You're using a term that I'm not sure I understand, which is MADI. What is MADI, and is it the same thing as Dante or audio over IP, which we hear a lot about? MADI stands for Multi Audio Digital Interface. It was about 20, 25 years earlier than any kind of audio over IP, which is why it's predominantly used still today. So, MADI is simply a point to point audio digital format. And RME was one of the early adopters of that format and put it in many of their audio interfaces. And many digital consoles like Digico, SSL, Avid, et cetera, use MADI as one of the ways to get out of the console. Maddie's technically not a network audio like Dante and AVB are or Cobranet, but a lot of people lump Maddie in that discussion because like Dante, it carries 64 channels of audio. Maddie's been around a quite a long time, uh, works just like a mic cable, you know, and point to point plugging signals. And in a live situation, especially touring sound, when you roll into a venue and you have to quickly set up Maddie's just a faster, easier way to get audio around, and people are comfortable with it because it works much like, you know, patch cords and mic cables. So it's a way of taking multiple audio signals and feeding them down a single cable so you minimize the number of cables that are running across the stage. Yeah. And for the listeners who've been to the fairgrounds or any big festivals and you see those big copper snakes that you have to step over, it eliminates all of that. One of the things that I was reading on the RME website is they were talking about the quality of their drivers and their codecs, which is something that you guys have been working on for years and years. Yeah. I've, yeah. I've noticed that a lot of audio companies stress their drivers and codecs. Why are these important, and how can we tell a good one from a bad one? In general, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of the interview that you know, we're, we're widely known for audio interfaces. What do audio interfaces do? They, get, they capture audio to the computer or they allow you to play back audio from the computer. So to your question, what separates RME is exactly what your question addresses, which is we pretty much do most of our technology in-house, and we've been doing that for quite some time. One of the biggest things that separates us from our competition is that we've been writing our own drivers and we abandoned EEPROMs a long time ago and started using FPGA chips or field programmable gate arrays. And what that allows us to do, and, and just you know, truth in, in, in advertising here, a lot of companies are getting hip to that today, but we've been doing this for many years. And it allows us to write the firmware and put a DSP software mixer in there. We, we write our own drivers for Mac and Windows, and we can stay very current, very relevant. So, for example, we have customers that are using our FireWire interfaces that we manufactured over 18 years ago. And if you think about all the upgrades of Mac and Windows operating systems over 18 years, most every other audio interface company, if you owned it, you would have had to replace it by now. Um, so we're very proud of that. So our motto is you only have to buy quality once. So we work very, very hard on writing a stable driver and the driver, for those of, the, of, you, of your listening audience that don't know, this is the software essentially that communicates with the OS and allows the DAW, the hardware, the converter all to work together to get audio in and out with no glitches, no pops, no clicks, no dropouts. And the better the driver, the lower latency you get, which is the delay that you hear from the time you produce the sound in the analog world to the time it goes through the computer and comes back out and you hear it through your headphones or your studio monitors. So if you're using virtual synthesizers, playing guitar, but using software amplifier modeling plugins, latency is going to be something you notice right away. So when we get to your question, which was, you know, codecs and drivers and all of that, we work very hard to make that work as fast and as efficiently and reliable and stable as possible. So we use um, USB, Thunderbolt, Firewire as our three main bus protocols. If you're going to use an external 
interface, but if you're going to use a PCI Express card and put it right in the computer and get the, get it right on the motherboard, we can get even lower latency. So anytime critical performance is needed, low latency, lots of audio, um, you're monitoring software and plugins and running many instances of those things, and you do not want to hear uh, any problems, you know, RME is going to be your choice for that. And that's sort of what our reputation has been built on over the last 20 years or so. I like your line, you only need to buy quality once, which gets me to a question, what have you got that's new? Funny you should ask. So, you know, we talked about Maddie for a big part of this uh, discussion, and we're, you know, we, we make audio interfaces that, you know, have mic inputs, line inputs, digital I.O., like ADAT, Toslink, SPDIF, and Maddie. And for the last couple of years, we have been working on AVB and uh, most recently Dante. Um, you asked a question about audio over IP, and that certainly is the trend in 2018 and beyond. A lot of our customers have been requesting, when is RME going to start manufacturing an audio interface that can speak some kind of um, audio networking protocol? So we decided, let's do them both. Let's do AVB and let's do Dante. Um, AVB stands for Audio uh, Video Bridging. It's a standard that the Audio Engineering Society has been working on for many years. While that was all happening, Dante, which was developed by a company by the name of Audinate, um, that's the new format. And it's a little more plug and pay play. It doesn't require as much um, tinkering to get it to work. And the idea behind it is you just connect audio gear with Cat5 cables and, and routers like you would have at home for your computer. And you can see all the gear and, and use a matrix, software matrix called Dante Controller and connect it like a digital patch bay. Um, so RME has just come out with two new products, a DigiFace Dante and a DigiFace AVB. Essentially, functionally speaking, they both do the same thing. They just speak the different protocols that I just mentioned. So what makes this product so exciting is that we're getting RME's one to two millisecond round trip latency performance because we're using our USB driver, but then we're putting it out on a Dante network. What's unique about the RME product and what we're really excited about is that all of our audio interfaces have something built into it called total mix effects. And this is a constant thread through all of our products. We're excited because the Dante digital, DigiFace Dante product has total mix as part of the package, which means it's putting a software mixer on the network. So I tell the average Dante user, imagine using Dante controller with faders. And it gives you the ability to not only select and do routings, but it, you can submix and control levels on the network as well. So that's pretty spectacular stuff. And to my knowledge, we're the only company that's doing that. And for people that want more information about these and all of your products, where can they go on the web? So there's a couple of websites, and I, I have to always say it like this because we are a German company, rme-audio.com, and that's the U.S. site. So it's a little more Americanized, you might say. And then the German site, which sort of serves the whole world, a little more clinical of a site, just has, you know, specs and things like that, is, is rme-audio.de. That website is rme-audio.com. And Derek Badala is the Director of Sales for the Americas for RME. And Derek, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Jeremy Mims is the Head of Strategy at Spoken Layer. Spoken Layer is the largest provider of spoken media content to Alexa, Google Home, and other platforms. And it's used by clients such as Gannett, Hearst, McClatchy, Gatehouse Media, Post Media, and many more. Hello, Jeremy. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. Now that I've read your introduction, I'm still confused. How would you describe Spoken Layer? So Spoken Layer is a platform for media companies to make sure that their content can be uh, heard in, in voice. And in many cases, it's on platforms like Amazon Alexa, uh, Google Assistant, and Google Home. Uh, Apple Siri, and anywhere else where somebody might be in a position to listen to content or listen to news or information, um, as opposed to reading it or watching a video. Well, what's the difference between what you're doing and a podcast? So what's interesting is podcasting tends to be a little bit longer form. It tends to have a very host-driven uh, sensibility, 
we think of podcasts as kind of the Cadillacs of, of the audio world. And a lot of what we're doing is higher quality uh, in some ways, but it's also a lot more frequent. So uh, podcasts might come out on a weekly schedule. Most of our content providers are doing something daily. Uh, and rather than a show being, let's say, 20 minutes to an hour long, um, the typical amount of content that we're creating is in the two minutes to five minute range. And so it's a it's short form versus long form. It's ephemeral in many cases versus uh, evergreen or show based. Uh, it's not necessarily the same host that's reading all the content all the time. So you could either think of this as, as a lot of short podcasts, or you could think of podcasts and this new emerging world of voice as, as being distinct. Um, I don't know that anybody's figured it out yet. Well, is this similar to audiobooks, where you're taking news stories from one of the Gannett or Hearst newspapers and just simply reading the text? In some cases, we are doing that. But in many others, what happens is uh, articles come into our system. Uh, there's a process of adaptation uh, for voice. Uh, there's a scripting process, and a short show is created. And so instead of it being just a, uh, a flat article read, uh, in many cases, it's a, a combination of different stories or uh, different, different areas. And the, the show itself is really designed to make sure that uh, it's giving people a useful, small package of information. It seems to me that you really have two clients. You've got the client that originates the content, we'll say Gatehouse or Post, and then you've got the people who consume the content. Who do you view as your consumers? Well, everything that we do needs to be listener first. In any media form, you have to, you have to focus on three things. You need uh, great quality content. You need an audience so people can consume that content. And then you need some way to pay for it. And the model that we've struck out right now for media companies is to create something that's compelling and useful that can attract an audience. And we're seeing pretty good growth uh, amongst most of our media company partners. And then the other piece for, for our puzzle is to make sure that they can pay for it. And so you can either bring in sponsors or advertisers or uh, in the future subscriptions and affiliate fees for, for commerce transactions and things like that. Uh, so we need all of that to work together, but our, our end user really is the, is the one that needs to be satisfied first and foremost. And what I'm trying to figure out is who's the end user? Is it somebody in their living room listening to the radio, except it's not radio? In many cases, yes. So Alexa and Google Home, uh, and to a lesser extent, but perhaps greater in the future, Apple's HomePod, these are social devices. They, in many ways, you might consider them to be a new iteration of radio, um, it's interactive radio. That is an important part of this, but I think it's important to state that the voice space is much bigger than these smart speaker devices. And smart speakers are growing at a rate that's about twice as fast as the iPhone at a similar uh, period in history. Uh, so this is one of the fastest technological adoptions ever. Um, but if you start thinking about uh, a smart speaker is something that is an internet connection, uh, a microphone, and a speaker. It turns out that there's a lot of things that qualify. So all of your mobile phones, uh, every every smartphone is a smart speaker. Uh, it's just a more personal listening experience. Every new car that's coming out now is a smart speaker. And everything that kind of fits into the wearables category, smart headphones, things like the Apple Watch, uh, it turns out that Probably within the next two years or so, um, the smart speaker space or the the audio space or the, the voice space, depending on who you ask, will be as big as radio. Um, it will have the same type of ubiquity where 90 plus percent of Americans are in a position to be able to consume this content through some device that they have access to. And it's very exciting. And it should also be a little bit terrifying to, to different people because new habits are being formed and new content is going to be created. And anytime you have a new thing like this, some of the old rules can get thrown away, but we don't know which ones those are. So everything is a constant experimentation 
an iteration to try to create a product that we're proud of, that our, our customers are proud of, and that listeners want to engage with on a regular basis. The phrase that, that you said that stuck in my mind is you're really a new form of radio. Is it you're taking content and delivering it to entirely new mechanisms? Is that a fair analogy? I think it is. And I, I think sometimes the space focuses on the interactive elements, which are, are certainly uh, some of the most exciting things. But I also think that there's a lot of value in the idea that you can end up with a personalized or customized experience in audio that includes everything from these short form pieces to long form podcasts to radio stations themselves or TV stations. And it can include video eventually. And it, it just is it's truly exciting. And I, I think you're right. I think this could be what the next version of radio is. A lot of the people that listen to this podcast create content, but they're not working for major news or studio organizations. Are you looking for independent voices, and does all the content have to originate with you? We certainly don't originate most of the content. So a lot of the content that's being created right now is coming through uh, partners that are, are writing it or creating it. Part of Spoken Layer's process is to assign content to storytellers. So uh, we have hundreds of people that help make these stories come alive in voice. And uh, that's certainly a big part of our, uh, our process. But the other thing that's, that's pretty interesting, we know that there's going to be room here for a lot of independent production and voices and stories that, that people want to tell. And so we want to make sure that they have access to this. Uh, most of our efforts right now have been amongst kind of bigger enterprise types of clients. But like any evolving space, it may start off that way, but then it will go to independent creators. And we definitely want to make that possible. For people that want more information about the products and services you offer, where can they go on the web? Uh, you can go to SpokenLayer.com. We are always open to new ideas and new ways of thinking about things. We love working with anybody who has a, an opinion and a thought process around this uh, that might be even a little bit different than ours. We love being challenged. Um, we're also hiring, so we, we, have a lot of, we have a lot of things to do. We need a lot of people to help us do this. That website is all one word, spoken, S-P-O-K-E-N, layer, L-A-Y-E-R, spokenlayer.com. And Jeremy Mims is the head of strategy at Spoken Layer. Jeremy, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much. Pleasure. I want to introduce you to a new website, Thalo.com. Thalo is an artist community and networking site for creative people to connect be inspired and showcase their creativity. Thalo.com features content from around the world with a global perspective on all things creative. Thalo is the place for creative folks to learn, collaborate, market, and sell their works. Thalo is a part of Thalo Arts, a worldwide community of artists, filmmakers, and storytellers. From photography to filmmaking, performing arts to fine arts, and everything in between, Thalo is filled with the resources you need to succeed. Visit Thalo.com and discover how their community can help you connect, learn, and succeed. That's Thalo.com. Rob Reed is currently the business development manager for Roland's professional AV division. With more than 20 years of media experience, he's also owned his own production company, has produced and streamed numerous live events, working with groups like Facebook Live, Ustream, Telestream, ChurchStreaming.tv, BoxCast, Brand Live, and The Cube. Hello, Rob. Welcome back. Thank you very much, Larry. Glad to be here. Rob, today we're talking about audio. So where does Roland fit in the audio world? We have a long history of, of audio, obviously, uh, coming from the musical instrument world. 
But more recently, uh, in the pro audio world, we've been making digital consoles pretty consistently since uh, 2007. So from small format to large format uh, digital audio consoles and digital snakes as well. And a digital snake is what? Essentially, it is a preamp. So it'll actually take an audio source or an analog audio source and go into a box that converts it digitally and then transfers it over a Cat5 or Cat6 cable. So it's got mic pre's built into it and it'll also uh, convert line level audio to a digital format. Now, is this something that we've been hearing about already, which is like audio over IP or Dante or Matty? That's exactly what it is. Roland actually developed its own audio over Ethernet protocol called REAC, which stands for Roland Ethernet Audio Communication. It's a low latency, bi-directional audio transport protocol that we built uh, originally with our digital snakes and then built our consoles, digital audio console systems around uh, the REAC system. This brings up a good point. We've talked with people earlier in the show, and, and one company is using Maddie, another company is using Dante, and you're using React. Does that mean that I can't mix brands as I'm trying to build my, my gear? No, very far from it. Um, I think originally when that technology started coming out, there was another one called Anet, and there's a number of other ones that haven't continued on. But there really wasn't a standard out there. So all the different manufacturers were saying, okay, we want to build the best audio over Ethernet transport protocol for audio. So uh, let's build our own. Latency is a a huge issue. Uh, Being able to communicate both ways is an issue, is a a desire of the customers, as well as being able to control uh, devices remotely from one location. So for example, having a digital audio console, communicating with the digital snake, controlling the preamp control of that digital snake. Or for example, coming up with personal mixing system where maybe you want to be able to make an adjustment to someone's personal monitor mix from the front of house console uh, directly onto someone's small mixer on stage. So being able to communicate uh, back and forth as well as transport audio is is a key thing in, in the digital domain world. Thinking about Roland mixers, this is not a Roland story. A couple of years ago, I purchased my first digital audio mixer only to discover that its user manuals were incomprehensible and there was no online training. And I need to stress it wasn't from you guys. So how do you help us, especially for, for people that have been analog all the time or, or low-end gear, and we're moving up to digital for the first time, there is so much that's different. And, and operationally, and, and just in terms of the concepts you guys use, how do you get us up to speed? Our original digital audio console in 2007 was the M400. And what we did was actually we built the manual inside the console. So if you wanted to learn about a gate, you'd press gate, hit the help button, and it would say, what is a gate? How do you use a gate? And then the other thing that we did um, to get people up to speed was we created these kind of libraries. And the libraries were like, I want to EQ a guitar. And so are you EQing a nylon guitar, an acoustic guitar, an electric guitar? And so we put all of these kind of just general EQ parameters in there that you could pull up from a library and get a good starting point and then tweak till your heart's content. So there was a couple things that we implemented into our digital audio consoles to help people make that transition from analog to digital. I knew I bought the wrong console. That's that was the first mistake that I made. (laughs) There is so much diversity in audio and so many different deliverables, whether we're going to broadcast or streaming or we're doing uh, live work or front of house. How can we start to get a sense of what workflows work, what gear we need to assemble, and, and where can Roland help us in that regard? Specific division I am at it's Pro AV. So it is an audio and a video component. And one of the things that I think um, people need to consider when they're working with live production workflows and streaming workflows or recording is in 99% of the time, the audio mix that you want to do for the room is going to be different from the broadcast. It's going to be different than the record. It's going to be different than the web stream. So having the ability to stay in a digital domain, for example, the most common digital audio transport protocol is Dante, probably most commonly used between microphones, speakers, digital audio consoles, snakes, And we actually, not to really talk much about the video product, but we actually have expansion cards that can go directly into our video mixer where we can pick off audio channels to mix for our broadcast or our web stream. 
separately from what's happening in the front of house console area. Why is the front of house mix different from what you're feeding out for broadcast or streaming? Because you're, you're EQing it for the room or you're turn, tuning it for the room or the speaker system and not necessarily doing that same mix for the broadcast or the record. Or maybe your broadcast or record, you want to do a surround mix. You're not necessarily wanting to do a surround mix in the live room. So you're going to have separate audio mixes for those two or three or four different audio mix options. Which gets me to the gear that we need to do the mix and what's some of the new audio gear that Roland has got. Well, actually, we make the uh, M5000 Orca series, which we make a smaller format called the M5000C. Um, it is a 128 audio resource mixer. So in other words, um, 128 resources that could be used as audio channels, auxes, mix minuses, 5.1, you know, just main mixing channels. There's a number of ways of configuring those resources. So there's the M5000C, and then the big brother is the M5000. And really the difference is the smaller format or the compact format, the M5000C has eight less sliders faders. And the nice thing about the Orca console series is, as I mentioned earlier, we have expansion cards. So it natively is React um, because it communicates directly with our digital snake system, which has been around for a long time. But we also have the Dante integration. So you can actually take a Dante card and stick it into the audio console to then integrate with the Dante workflow as well. So that's the M5000 and the M5000C Orca console. Rob, what's a feature that makes your products unique? I think one of the unique things really about our workflow, and I know I want to focus on video products, was the ability for our video mixer to integrate Dante. And what that provides from a workflow standpoint is to de-embed audio from a video source, send it over the Dante network, and now the person mixing sound for the room with a Dante-enabled console can now, without having separate embedder de-embedders from the audio standpoint, can mix the audio coming from that video source without leaving the digital domain. I think that is a super, super unique story for Roland and any production workflow. I was wandering through um, NAB in April and discovered there are a lot of different digital consoles that are out there. When we're deciding what gear to buy, what should we use as criteria? In other words, what, what is core that we need to know and what tends to be marketing nice to have? First of all, it's got to be easy to use. And, you know, you want to be able to mix fairly quickly in a live production environment. But I think second and most importantly is the sound quality. How is it going to sound? What's, what's the sound quality? With the M5000 series, we're natively at 24-bit 96 kilohertz. So a very, very high resolution quality. Uh, so it gives you a lot of headroom. Um, it gives you a lot of ability to have great sound throughout your whole digital mix. I think those are the two things that you really need to look at. And then thirdly would be the interoperability between all the other manufacturers out there from speakers to microphones to whatever your workflow might be. So having all those things, the nice thing about the M5000 series or the Orca console series, it stands for open, high-resolution, configurable architecture. That's what Orca stands for. And what that means is open means that we can talk with any format. We got Matty expansion cards. We have Dante. We have React. And then high resolution, 24-bit, and configurable means I can take 128 resources and turn them into anything I want, whether it's mixing channels, auxes, DCAs, mix minuses, 5.1, all those options. So I think those are the key things when you are looking for a live production audio console is, you know, does it play nicely with others? Does it sound good? Is it easy to use? Is it reliable? Those are all the main things that people look for. And for people that want more information about the products that Roland has to offer, where can they go on the web? Proav.roland.com. That's three different chunks of words. That's P-R-O-A-V dot Roland, R-O-L-A-N-D, Dot com. And Rob Reed is the Business Development Manager for Roland's Professional AV Division. And Rob, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me again, Larry. I was just thinking, audio on set has gotten much more complex over the years. 
As cameras walk through the action, there are fewer places for boom operators to hide. As more actors speak within a scene, the old days of using two or three mics to cover principal talent are increasingly insufficient. I was struck in talking with Paul Isaacs of Sound Devices that there is now a need for 64 channels of audio mixing and recording on location. Now, granted, that channel count is most often used in reality programming where it's impossible to know who is going to say something at any particular moment, but still, that is a lot of audio. In the past, if we had a show that was that complex, it would be handled by a fully equipped audio post truck. Now, the technology exists in a portable device operated by one audio engineer. I'm also intrigued with the flexibility provided by Maddie for point-to-point -point connections and Dante for networking audio devices. I worked with Dante for the first time at NAB this year. We had a Yamaha digital mixer feeding a Dante signal to both a Dell laptop and an Apple MacBook Pro, each computer recording the entire show plus every individual mic in Adobe Audition. What I liked about Dante was that it supplied dozens of high-quality audio channels over a single Ethernet cable that I could deliver to multiple computers at once, even if they weren't in the same location as the mixer. And, having wrestled my share of audio cable bundles in the past, putting 64 channels of microphones into a single Ethernet cable is pretty darn amazing. Before I started recording our interview, I was talking with Paul Isaacs about the rapid advances in audio technology. While microphones are the most obvious and do improve over time, the biggest changes have been in how we move the audio signal from one place to another and the audio consoles we use to mix it once it gets there. This new shift to distributing audio over IP, which Dante represents, allows us to capture a scene with multiple mics in Toronto while mixing it live in Los Angeles and streaming it out of servers based in St. Louis. Pretty amazing. Just something I'm thinking about. I want to thank this week's guests, Paul Isaacs with Sound Devices, Derek Badala with RME, Jeremy Mims with Spoken Layer, Rob Reed with Roland, and James DeRuvo with Doddle News. There's a lot of history in our industry, and it's all posted to our website at digitalproductionbuzz.com. Here you'll find thousands of interviews all online and all available to you today. And remember to sign up for our free weekly show newsletter that comes out every Saturday. Talk with us on Twitter at DPBuzz and Facebook at digitalproductionbuzz.com. Our theme music is composed by Nathan Doogie Turner with additional music provided by smartsound.com. Our producer is Debbie Price. My name is Larry Jordan, and thanks for listening to the Digital Production Buzz. The Digital Production Buzz is copyright 2018 by Thalo LLC.